Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we're taking a look at classics of British cinema, and the subject is the 1936 production, Things to Come, directed by William Cameron Menzies and adapted from H.G. Wells' novel by himself. H.G. Wells. Now this is a major classic of British science fiction and one of the most ambitious films made in terms of its production size and in terms of its vision to that moment in Britain. We'll be talking about that and a host of other interesting things after today's screening. Joining us will be Dr. Michael Kramer who teaches at the City College and is a noted expert on H.G. Wells and science fiction. Now take a look at the future as seen in 1936 in Things to Come. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. Here in the 21st century, I hope you've, had a, you've enjoyed an opportunity to see how the future was imagined from 1936. In this visually extraordinary film, Things to Come, directed by William Cameron Menzies and written by H.G. Wells. To talk about this very rich film with us today, I have one of my colleagues from the City College of New York, Dr. Michael Kramer. Uh, he teaches media studies, uh, and he's an expert on H.G. Wells and the history of science fiction. Indeed, he's uh, recently written an introduction to a collection of the science fiction novels of H.G. Wells. Uh, in addition to that, he's an active actor filmmaker uh, with a keen interest in uh, Victorian popular culture and fiction. Welcome to City, City Cinematheque, Michael. Great to be here, Jerry, thank you. Super. So let's recover a little bit who H.G. Wells was in, in, in the kind of totality of his career and, and who we remember today and how that might be different from how he thought of himself. So who was Wells? Well, today Wells is remembered primarily as the author of four famous science fiction novels uh, that were written very early in his career. Uh, the Time Machine, uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, The Invisible Man, and The War of the Worlds. And he's remembered mostly for the film versions of those novels, not so much for the novels themselves. But during his lifetime, in addition to being what we sometimes call the father of science fiction, uh, he shares that title with Jules Verne, he was primarily a uh, futurist and okay. a historian. Okay, okay, uh, and, and one of considerable fame and productivity. That is, he was a journalist who was always writing, uh, and he was one of those go-to guys uh, ready to talk about uh, the future and his ideas about um, about. Uh, about everything, and I think we, we sort of forget that. I mean, that when you have a film, and we'll get to the film in a minute, we have a film with H.G. Wells' name on it, it is one of those names known by virtually everyone. It's true, uh, although most people have a very different idea of Wells than he would like them to have, I think, because uh, when you just know him through the film adaptations of his work, whether the ones that were made in the 50s or in the 70s or the more recent ones, he seems to be primarily an author of adventure fiction, and he wasn't. He was a very serious author of speculative right. science fiction. Right. Okay. Uh, so let's just talk, just a, 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 before we get to the film it, it itself and its relationship with genre and, and, and all of this, this is not, while he wrote the original script, it is an adaptation. An adaptation of what? It's an adaptation of a couple of different things. First, it's an adaptation of his novel from 1933 uh, by the same title. And also, it's an adaptation of sections of his very famous Outlines of History, oh. the third section of which was about the future of mankind and where he saw mankind going. Okay, and by the way, if, if, I, can, if I can get you know, anecdotal about that, uh, that his Outlines of History was enormously popular 
uh, around the English-speaking world. And I do very much remember uh, my grandfather, uh, who loved thinking about politics and history and all of those, those things. That was one of his books. He, he was a kind of, you know, it was a reference. Wells was the kind of person who, if you agreed with him or not, he was a point of reference for many, many people. One of my favorite references to H.G. Wells anywhere in American popular culture is in The Maltese Falcon when Caspar Gutman says to Sam Spade, this is history, not Mr. Wells' history, but history nonetheless. He's speaking of the outlines of history. Okay, and, and uh, because Wells had, and we're gonna get to this inside in the film in a few minutes, because Wells had very, uh, you know, set ideas about things. I mean, he viewed himself in a kind of uh, prophetic way, as a secular, as a secular one. But he, you know, and, and many people had faith in that—that that he was um, a man who was leading us towards uh, something. You agreed or disagreed, but he certainly was going to make it uh, clear, as he did in in all of his writings, about what his specific ideas about this were. So let's let's draw back a little bit and talk about him uh, and science fiction. So if he's the father, one of the fathers of, of, of science, science, science fiction, I'll do credit to Jules Verne as well, though he's not our subject today, what does that, what, what does that mean and, and how does this work that comes much later in his career fit in with that? I mean, what, what's the kind of pattern? Well, his very first published works were uh, science fiction works. He wrote uh, a short story that eventually became The Time Machine, which was his first novel. Um, he created an idea of using uh, imaginative fiction, what they sometimes called scientific romances right. back in the day, as a uh, means of exploring the possible future of mankind and very deep philosophical questions. You know, at roughly the same time, um, there was historical science, or not historical, uh, adventuresome science fiction, right. heroic science fiction coming about, John Carter of Mars and, and that sort of thing, which eventually becomes you know, Star Wars. Right. But uh, Wells saw science fiction as a way to look at uh, mankind's great questions and where they might be taking us. Okay, so it, for him, it genuinely is a laboratory of thought in some in some way, and that's this kind of science. Just as a scientist, you know, takes something into his laboratory and sees what the outcome is. In this kind of speculative fiction, he's going to take ideas into the laboratory of the genre, as it were, and come out with some possible outcomes. And then those become, I take it, that his ideas those become uh, objects of debate. And even if they're influential enough, they actually become. Um, a basis for policy uh, making in some ways, whether wh whether he you know gets directly involved or not, but that's a possible outcome. I mean, he's not somebody who's just interested in ideas per se, but his ideas should lead to policy. And that shows up in two very important ways. Uh, one, Wells was one of the people that helped draft the Charter of the League of Nations. He was a utopianist. He believed in a a future with a one-world socialist government, and he uh, helped to create the League of Nations with that in mind. Um, and two, he predicted a, a lot of things that later came to pass in his writings. One of the things he predicted was uh, atomic warfare. And uh, a couple of the scientists who first conceived of the atomic bomb, in fact, the person who patented the idea of a nuclear reactor, said he got the idea from H.G. Wells. So we're in one of those bizarre loops of fiction creating science that then becomes science fiction. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in the eternal chicken and egg kind of situa right. uh, 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 si situation. So where does this film itself kind of fit into do you see how he worked and what he would want to be doing? I think the, the thing about this film and where it fits with Wells' career is that it really expresses, I think, in the most complete way, his vision for the future in a fictional form. He'd, he'd played with this vision, he'd danced around it several times, 
Um, he'd written about it as early as uh, his Anticipations, which was a very early work in his career. But this uh, it kind of demonstrates where he thinks society is going and where he hopes society will end up. Um, he's an ardent pacifist, and he sees that war is going to become more and more terrible until we eventually all give up on war. Um, he's a uh, believes in a one-world socialist government, and he sees that as the utopia that we're working towards. And all of that is displayed in this film. And he believes that, uh, that pilots are among the most important people in the world, pilots and aeronautical engineers, and that they are the people that really we should be looking to to guide us to the future. And uh, that's very clear in this movie. Well, as well. absolutely, abs uh, absol absolutely the case. So, uh, thinking about this, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a unique occasion, perhaps, in in film history, uh, in which you have someone who is an incredibly well-known commentator upon contemporary society and the future, um, a literary man as well as a man of politics and of what we would call futurology or futurism, who actually manages to get involved with film on a film made on this scale, because this is one of the largest productions made at Britain to that point with a major producer, Alexander uh, Korda, who has under his belt at this point uh, 10 to 15 years of very large and groundbreaking breaking productions. They have uh, the man who invented the profession of production designer in film and the phrase, uh, you know, because we, some people bounce between art director and production designer, but it was William Cameron Menzies who directs the film, but who's also been one of the major people to, to develop the look of, that we consider a Hollywood look of opulence and grandeur and of fantasy, being able to enter other realms, but to do so in this illusionist manner, so that that realm we enter is highly credible, even though we've never been there. You know, we've, never, we've not been to the 21st century at this, but to, to give it a, a sense of detail um, and credibility. So that's you know, a kind of unique instance of somebody having this particular vehicle, uh, cinema, to be able to communicate, and, and I do use this word. I don't, I'm, I'm not a person who talks about every work of art by any means, having a message, but Wells is a person who creates smart art to create his messages and his idea. He, he is a, an author of ideas. Yes, and there's so much that's interesting just about this film as a film. Uh, the, the really fabulous cast of, oh. of classical British actors. Um, the, the visuals in the film are striking. When you look at other science fiction movies from the 1930s, uh, this movie, the production values are so much greater than most of those. Uh, but it also has just its incredible use of shadow. Uh, and and uh, it's, I think, some marvelous special effects, uh, not just for the time, but for any time period. I, I think that, that particularly in some of the the battle scenes, uh, oh, yes. the, the air raid scenes, and things like that are, are amazing. Well, and, and you, you bring up you bring up a very interesting point because we're now we're talking about the mid '30s. People have command of of sound, which is which happens very very rapidly. It happens in less than ten years uh, to have complete command of this. But at this moment, there there a lot of films are shying away from uh, certain aspects of the of the of visual aspects and certain. Uh, e editing aspects of the 1920s. And this is a very uh, distinctly hybrid film in a number of ways. Uh, Corder, Corda begins his career in Central Europe, is aware of all of commercial production, but he's also aware of all of the avant-garde, the Soviet avant-garde, German or more even you call it Central European Expressionism. And we don't associate those things save for that clever man, Alfred Hitchcock, always with the British cinema. And yet all of that um, you know, expertise in the avant-garde, in editing, in shot design, in, as you say, this elaborate use of, of, of shadows and interplay of, 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 of light and dark is all in this film. And it's just packed with 
you know, with visual ideas and, uh, uh, and with editorial ideas. Absolutely the case. Let's come back to him as a man of politics, because you've already mentioned this um, a, couple of a, a, a couple of times. Uh, he is, as the phrase would go, he was a card-carrying car socialist. Yes, although he often said not a Marxist. It's, it's very yeah. interesting. He, uh, he supported Lenin. He was an apologist for Stalin. Uh, but he didn't like certain things about Marx, and I find that very interesting. Um, you know, was, part of it was you know, the standard complaint about Marx, that to Marx everything is a nail and there's one hammer. <laughs> right? And he's going to hit everything with the same hammer. Right, and with that hammer being class. That's right. Yeah, right. So, um, so let's, let's talk about the, what the politics of this film uh, look like. I mean, and also uh, what we might think of those politics. Because this is a film being put out in the mid-1930s. So what's his... What's his, you know, line here? What is he... His main political line is that, uh, that the capitalist nation state is archaic. It's a necessary part of human development and now it needs to be moved beyond. Um, which is, you know, the, the same thing that socialism would say in this regard. Uh, he is um, very much against... Uh, militarism. He's a, mm -hmm. he's a pacifist. Uh, I think one of the real important things about this film is that it says uh, it takes place in every town. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't specify that it's London, although visually it's obviously London. Right. Right. Um, he doesn't name England. He doesn't name Germany, even though he's talking about England and Germany. Uh, those labels are completely unimportant to him. Doesn't matter what the nation is. Doesn't matter who the prime minister is. Doesn't matter who the people are. Uh, this is the normal course of history. And what he sees in history is that war is becoming so terrible that it needs to be done away with. And the only way that it can be done away with is by getting rid of nations and having a single one world state. And I think that was clearly his project from the very beginning of uh, his career. Okay, well, uh, I want to come back to some of the predictions, but then I also want to, for the moment, uh, keep us on this notion that when the film was received um, by critics, and it got, it got a mixed reception, it was admired for many aspects, but, uh, but obviously a number of people were not, uh, you know, always enthusiastic about Mr. Wells' uh, <laughs> ideas. And so the point that you make about the fact that he doesn't name a nation was very important to some of the critics because while, while Wells would have been a, an apologist for Stalin and for the kind of state that he hoped would be created there, obviously he was not sympathetic with, uh, with, with Hitler. Yet some people said, well, you know, you're talking about a society in which the Nazis have created virtually everything you're talking about. You don't like their attitude towards certain kinds of people, but Who's to say that these enlightened people, who's to say who the enlightened people are? Um, because that class of the elite that you're talking about, how you get to be named in that and who gets this, this power is a, is a rather vague thing in the film um, you know, itself and was an object of criticism that you, know, you may think you're on this side, but look out because this model can be used as easily by the other side. By 1933, um, Wells's politics had really marginalized him. He had moved further and further uh, out of the mainstream of British politics. Uh, pacifism was kind of on the decline because mm -hmm. of, because of uh, uh, Hitler in Germany. And so it was very easy to criticize Wells. And I think the, the, a lot of people saw the criticisms as very fair that he's extremely anti-democratic. Oh, okay. But it, it's on the table now, right? Okay. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He is very anti-democratic. He, he believes in a society that's controlled by intellectual elites, particularly scientists. Um, he, he believes that scientists are the only truly rational people. This comes up in his fictional work again and again and again. Even the evil scientists in Wells, like 
uh, Dr. Moreau and the Invisible Man are, are clearly superior to everyone around them. Right. And they just want to be left alone to conduct science because they believe, and I think Wells believes too, that, that soci society puts too many rules on science that it should be uh, uh, left free to advance progress. Well, as, as is the setup for the climactic ending of the film itself with the you know, shooting of the, of, <laughs> uh, uh, of the gun, and it, I mean, it's made, it, it's quite explicit in the film, uh, this, uh, th this, this debate that they have to do this because these forces represented again by the artist character, the dangerous artist character uh, played by Cedric, uh, Cedric Hardwick, uh, that these people will never allow humanity to progress, 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 because it's only this scientific elite in which he invests so heavily philosophically that have that vision and that capacity. Wells hated artists. He hated artists. Um, that's very clear in a passage from um, uh, his uh, First Men in the Moon. Um, he, uh, he doesn't like artists. He doesn't like the artistic temperament. He believes that artists glorify the, uh, glorify the mankind in a way that is counterproductive. Right? They want to hang on to the past. They want man to be important. And to Wells, Humanity is not important. No. Humanity is not important at all. Only progress is important. Uh, and he wants the march of progress just to be unfettered by emotional attachment to the past, which is something he sees artists in particular as clinging to. Oh, it's a very interesting point because it also explains what you might call the, the rather odd concept to some people, the odd concept of characterization in the film, because these are not characters that are invested with any psychology or any kind of weight of, 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 of interiority. They are either what they do or the ideas they have. And of course, you know, he's interested in the debate over ideas conducted by some characters as a kind of question and, and, and answer. And then visually, you know, your anti-democratic um, you know, uh, hypothesis is, is absolutely supported by the evidence of the film because w literally we have that elite class standing above within the production design the majority of time the people who, as, as one critic said, the, the future seems to have a space that's the largest shopping mall ever created. <laughs> 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 but of course, that, because those shopping malls had not been created yet, so we can even say... Did somebody see things to come when they were a kid and designed a shopping mall in that way to make the future come true? But, but my point being that they are, the masses are treated as masses to be, you know, to be held literally at the, at, at the gates because progress, represented by the space gun, can't happen unless they're under the control of the elites who, on a good day, they will understand the vision of the progress in the future. That's right. Uh, he didn't trust people. He didn't trust the people to make rational decisions for their own governance. He thought they were too emotional. He thought they were irrational. He thought that they were uh, uneducated uh, and shouldn't be given the vote. He didn't like it at all. Okay. And that, uh, and we don't have much time, but, but hence that middle section of the film with, Sir Ra with S not yet Sir Ralph, but with Ralph Richardson, in really quite a performance. So how does that fit with Wells' ideas? Well, I think that fits with Wells' ideas because uh, the boss was popular. He, he used power, uh, violence to, to kind of cement his power, but in fact, he became the boss because uh, the people saw him as a protector. Uh, he protected people from the wandering sickness. Uh, and I think that in one regard, he sees that as a, uh, typical of what happens when society breaks down. When society breaks down as a result of, of war, uh, what happens is we revert to a feudal society. Right. Um, I, I think that that's a, a common trope among, uh, among socialist thinkers. Uh, and on the other hand, I think that he sees the boss as being somewhat necessary. Uh -huh. yeah? uh, there has to be some control uh, in, in Wells' vision over 
the people. Right. Uh, the people don't get to control themselves. So he, but the, the interesting point there is that the, the boss is simply uh, an anterior stage in what, because Wells has a very much evolutionary view. Of these uh, uh, of these things, and so if civilization breaks down, you devolve back to an earlier stage, and then your hope is to once again move through it, and then get to the enlightened bosses represented by the cabal character and played by uh, played by Raymond Massey. Exactly, exactly. Um, I really love that center section of the film for a lot of reasons. I love the whole movie, and I think each section is very different and very interesting. Um, I can't see most post-apocalyptic science fiction without mm. things to come. I, I can't. Uh, whether it's uh, a serious work like On the Beach or um, a fairly frivolous work like Mad Max or Book of Eli, especially Book of Eli, uh, it, which is very, very much that in, in, uh, in the way the, the post-apocalypse is portrayed. I'm going to have to stop you there with the credit you're giving for the creation of dystopian images to one of the great utopianists of the 20th, of the 20th century. Uh, if you've liked our discussion today, please join us here at CUNY TV for other discussions. And please visit our website, www.cuny.tv. That's only three W's, dot CUNY, dot TV. You'll learn how you can get on our mailing list for City Cinematech. You can learn about other programming at CUNY TV. And if you choose to do so, you can communicate with us by email. So please visit www.cuny.tv. Michael, thank you for bringing your expertise on H.G. Wells here. And perhaps there's a future in which <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be coming back. Thank you very much, Jerry. Great. And I want to thank you for joining us here today as we looked at things to come. And please join us in the future as we stroll through the archives of film history here on City Cinematheque. But for now, it's goodbye.